have one question. How many of you are here for your first TED Talk? My hand goes up too. I volunteered to do tours in the greenhouse. <laughs> when I was informed that I had 18 minutes to come up with an idea worth sharing, I've been scared ever since. <laughs> but thanks to Jenny and Dave who are putting this on and my coach Adora, I'm here. And they gave me this little sheet that said, the perfect TED talk. And I want to do at least three things that makes this a perfect talk. First thing, you have to mention coffee. <laughs> Everybody likes coffee. And we have the world premier coffee shop a couple of doors over. It's named Oxum. Oxum was the early original name of the capital of Ethiopia where coffee was discovered. So welcome to the coffee house in Winter Garden. The second word was brain. Wendy, yeah. if you would give me about a 10-minute <laughs> class, I might be ready to make my talk. <laughs> thank you for the little short exercise, and thank you, Dave, for scheduling the choir afterwards so I could get my breath again. <laughs> the third word, let me see now, what was the third word? Happiness. I'll guarantee you, in not much more or less than 18 minutes, you all will be very happy because I'll be done. <laughs> That's my idea. I think if each of you leave here today and really understand that you manage yourself, nobody else, I will have made my point. I believe that when I was created, I was given one human being to manage. That is to trigger in your mind the Big Bang. <laughs> so that sound is to trigger in your mind the creation of everything that is from the nothing which was. The creator, blessed be he, blessed be she, blessed be it, created the original creative spark. And that's good. Push, 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 keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. That is something I recorded. I had never seen a birth before. But my birth took place 737 feet from the box office of this theater. Dr. Davis came to the house about 3 o'clock in the morning. I was home delivered. And at that point, I began breathing. And at that point, I begin, began managing Burt Roper. And it's been a learning process ever since. I really have been proven not to be retarded in some areas. <laughs> but in some areas, I was quite retarded. And it wasn't until 1997 that I really spent five years ago in Atlanta trying to bring out an area that was really, I never got out of kindergarten until 97. So I'm a little bit slow. And it was really the business world that occupied much of my time. And I was in the citrus business over 50 years and had a wonderful experience. 
And a lot of what I learned was from our workers. The first experience, Dad sent me out to the grove to hold orange trees. How many of you hold orange trees? See, you haven't lived. <laughs> Hoeing orange trees, for me, was a learning experience, because we had some beautiful hoe hands. They could take a hoe and pull it so gracefully and smoothly as they worked down the row of trees. They were gorgeous. They had muscles. They'd go through that Bermuda grass, and it was gorgeous. Here's Bert, 15 years old. At that time, the workers were making 15 cents an hour. <coughs> I was overpaid because I was making 10 cents an hour. But here's me. <coughs> I'd hit that Bermuda grass and just shake. I didn't have the muscles. I really gained an appreciation for people who could manage their body beautifully and pull that hoe handle through the Bermuda grass gracefully. Another lesson, money. Anybody in here ever had a money problem? Show me your hand. Most of you were rich then, I see. Nobody has had money problems. <laughs> but I learned about money from my harvest workers. I'd sold a load of tangerines to uh, my customer in Detroit. I had the tangerines on the tree over near Claremont, and I sent the crew out to pick them. We got a phone call. The foreman says, Bert, they don't want to pick tangerines. I said, what are you paying them? He told me. I said, well, raise it a quarter. He calls me back a little while later, and he said, they don't want to pick tangerines. I said, raise it 50 cents. He called me back a little. He said, they don't want to pick tangerines. I said, pay them $2 and a half. Going rate was a dollar and a quarter. He calls me back in a little while, and he said, Bert, he said, tell the boss man a message. Us don't want to pick tangerines. What did I learn from that? You can't manage anybody else. You can't buy with money and make anybody do anything. I learned that lesson. I said, well, if I can't do it with my own muscles and I can't buy it with money, I made five beta kappa. Maybe I can get the words, and I'll talk them into doing what I want to do. I'll manage those pickers one way or the other. So I went out and took my camper and had breakfast with the boss. I'd bring him in, I'd feed him breakfast, and talk to him. And after a few weeks of that, it, any of you notice anything? Anybody that doesn't notice anything? <laughs> that's, we had a tangerine grow. And, and doesn't that smell good? Yeah. Harvest workers, I thought, had a wonderful life. They got to be in the out of doors all day. They got to smell the beautiful fragrance of the blossom in the springtime. But I really learned from them that people do what they want to do. And my words were not working. And I learned from them then that the idea that you can manage somebody else with words uh, is a myth. And that I was using words that I'd learned at Emory and the University of Pittsburgh. I couldn't use the ones I'd learned in the Navy because that wasn't <laughs> polite. <laughs> if you've ever played pinochle in the Navy, you know what it's like. But the Words I learned was that if I had a word and somebody else didn't understand what it meant and I used it, their feeling was that I was speaking down to them, I was speaking over them, and I was saying I'm better than you are. So words wouldn't do it. The muscles didn't do it. Money wouldn't do it. Words wouldn't do it. So I joined the American Management Association. That is the answer. And they taught me all about a line structure for a corporation and a, a staff. Anybody in here in staff or something or other? The poor line people hate your guts in case you don't know it. <laughs> Overhead. 
deadhead. That's what staff is. At any rate, I was having breakfast during that period with a group of men in Orlando, and I had the program one morning, and I said, okay, let me pose a question to our group. I've set up this mythical corporation. What was the sound we had? That was the birth of the cosmos. I said, whoever created the universe has got to be running the biggest business in the universe, because it is the universe. What does the corporate structure for the universe look like? The CEO's running it. The CEO's got a corporate structure. So if we had a little time here, it's fun to sit down and have you draw on a piece of paper what the corporate structure of the universe incorporated looks like. You got a bunch of employees. You got Buddha, you got Confucius, you got Muhammad, and the guy that stirs up a lot of trouble has got Jesus. <laughs> You've got the prophets. You've got everybody in the world but you only got one big boss in the universe that I set up mythically. So the question was, what did the corporate structure look like? These men came up with it, and this is a drawing from back in the 80s, and that was my idea of universe incorporated. And on the left-hand side, there's a creator. At this point, I have to move over because I'm on the right-hand side with all the rest of you. We're over here trying to make a living. We're trying to live a life. And the Creator's over on the other side. That was what I call the companion circles. And that was a little complex to teach my harvest workers who couldn't read and write. So I had tried words. In that case, I'd hired a consultant to come down, and he had a special 156-word vocabulary. And with that, he got a 20% recidivism on the people that he taught in prison. First time that had ever been done. I said, well, I can't afford that. So I came up with a 10-word vocabulary. And I lived with that till a few years ago, and I had to make it 12 words. And I think at optimum, it would be 13 words, whether that's lucky or unlucky. But I think if each of you in the audience would take the time to share with me 13 words, we would never part without being reconciled and being in harmony. So the word idea was pretty good. But this was too complicated. So I went to Atlanta, as I said, for a few years, and I need the structure for existence. So here we are, two or more human beings over here on this side. Any one of us can redefine that. One of my 10 words is group. A group is two or more people who've agreed on a goal. The goal was to be in the Garden Theater at 11 o'clock today. We're a group, and we won't go to the other words yet, but that was pretty complicated because each person on the right-hand side of the page is managing themselves. We get here in the middle, and trying to represent you and me and everybody here, I would like you to take your right hand and put it on top of your left hand. Everybody got that? Touch your left hand. That's where your management stops. <laughs> Anything inside your epidermis, you manage. Anything outside of your epidermis, in terms of a human being, the other person manages. Now, we can take our cars. One of the words the statistician said not to use was computer, but we copy ourselves in our tools and I can manage a computer. It's got a hard drive and it's got all that. But remember, your management is within your epidermis. So how do I manage myself? Here it is. I happen to believe that when the Creator came out 
and built this great universe incorporated. He said, I don't have anybody to manage. I'm going to get bored. And he said, well, maybe I don't want to manage anybody. He said, well, I don't create somebody like me. I'll create some in my image. So he created model 1.1, and he called that man. And what do men do? They complain. <laughs> they said, God, I'm lonesome down here. You created this thing, but I want something to have fun with. So what did he do? He took a rib. He made model 1.2. 1.2 had a little different plumbing, but other than that, <laughs> I think the mind system, the brain, which is one of the words I'm supposed to use statistically, is coffee, brain, and happiness. <laughs> so I want my talk. I talked to a statistician upstairs. We have one in our audience. He says, Bert, in all the statistics, there's always one particular scene that doesn't fit the statistical model. So I'm going to ask him when it's over, is this really a perfect talk, even though I use the word computer? I didn't wear a green shirt, and I don't have on purple pants. I did wear my shoes and socks, trying to get a little color into this thing. I think this is how every human being manages themselves. We sense. I got you to raise your hands. You sense. You touch your skin. You touch. I hope you smell the aroma of my wonderful citrus in this thing. I hope you're going to get to taste some good food. Arthur's does a good job. And I would want your senses to be part of it. And I believe in the sixth sense where we do get a download from a big computer in the sky. That's that other computer word I'm not supposed to use. The creator of the universe. Blessed be he, blessed be she. So we have our senses. We then sense some information. We start making our list. Wendy, you're on my list. And I want to learn more from you. Oops, I'm out of time. OK, you make your list. <laughs> you then. Agree with yourself, and you do it, and we can talk later. To go with this, I'll let this be my ending. This is just the idea of the quintessence. Everybody strives for balance. I hope you have physical balance with your muscles, mental balance with your brain. Your heart is full with joy for being here in Winter Garden today, and your prayers and inspiration will make your soul sing. Thank you.